An unfamiliar path with a pulse of its own. Three, two, one. Final encounter cast. Interesting conflicts, not conflicts of interest. Typical corporate bullshit. With your hosts, Nate, Robbie, Chris, Nika, and Kelly. FinalEncounterCast.com Ready, ready, get set, go! What's up? Welcome to Final EncounterCast. Thanks for joining us today. Twitch.tv slash Limit Break Radio is where the show can be found every Sunday. Thanks for allowing us a Sunday off as we prepared for E3 2017. Excited to be here today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, FinallyCounterCast.com is where you can subscribe to the podcast. Um, happy to be back home. Like, we had a great time. Don't get me wrong. We had an, we had an awesome time out at uh, E3 2017. But uh, also, also very happy to be home. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. By uh, by the end there, you're looking around this beautiful city. You're like, I really want to stay here, but at the same time, home. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll definitely talk about some of our E3 experiences today here on the show. Uh, also, I want to invite everyone to stick around after the show wraps up uh, after uh, at four o'clock. Uh, we switch over to Limit Break Radio. We'll talk all about the Stormblood early access and fiasco and that whole kerfuffle thing shenanigans. Um, and then after that, we will uh, actually be playing our uh, Checkpoint E3 2017 coverage down on the, the stream here. So uh, we invite you guys to stick around for that. That is, of course if the power holds out. Um, so we had mentioned, uh, uh, I think it was last, I, I think I mentioned it last week um, on, on Limit Break Radio. And again, mm -hmm. again, we do appreciate the uh, the week off that you, that you guys allowed us. Um, it, it, uh, it, it was really, really helpful to um, be able to kind of collect our notes and our thoughts and and really kind of lay out some of our our, our wrap up our panel wrap up segments uh, before we you know even left for e3 so um, having that time to to just sort of uh, you know collectively talk about um, you know what what was going on even though we we weren't on our way out there yet um, it, you know was was really really helpful although I think we learned a couple of really important things uh, you know, this year going out there, including that, you know, we, we should probably head out on, on Sunday. Well, yeah, obviously actually being there. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just like when you jump into a game. If you read a bunch of strats first or, you know, what you're supposed to do, actually getting in there is really more educational than anything you can read and having oh, totally. actual experience of being out there. I mean, I had one uh, interview that was like literally back to back and I was afraid, oh, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? And I had plenty of time because traversing the, uh, the, the floor was easy enough and most of the hands-on or the interviews started ahead of time and didn't right. quite take the 30 minutes so yeah yeah so i i mean it was uh it was really like we did some really good work yeah. uh, out from uh, E3 2017 this year. And you, if you haven't heard the coverage yet, if you haven't heard it uh, over one of our now 17 affiliates across uh, North America and Canada, well, uh, uh, U the United States and Canada, um, then uh, you'll hear it tonight after Limit Break Radio wraps up. Some people are saying it's our best episode yet. I really, I'm I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the, uh, the work uh, that we put in. Um, you guys, you you guys blew me away with uh, with with you know uh, your interview questions and how insightful and well recorded all of those were. Um, I tend to get a, a little bit of micromanagitis when we uh, you know get to one of these things. I was I was no. actually on edge a lot of the time because the headphones that I had didn't work like they were shorted out and, right. and it was too difficult to like you know ask questions and make sure the the mic's close enough while also trying to hold it in the right place. So eventually I was like ah screw it and I'm just trying to like watch the little uh, the lights on the bottom and just the audio and i'm like man i really hope this doesn't come out shitty yeah no it, it, everything uh i think sounded really really good Excellent. and uh i i was really really happy with uh the way that the coverage came out uh and i hope you guys will stick around because uh it, it's i i honestly i i think that uh it's some of our best work and here's the thing um y you know this show is supported by uh you the listeners over at patreon.com slash limit break radio and it was because of you that we started 
started this show and you know we've said it before we've said it a million times but you know we took the best material that we had within like 20 episodes of uh, of this show and we presented that as the first demo reel for uh, you know that that became checkpoint radio yeah, this is all because of you guys everything that happens yeah absolutely and uh it it really is because of your support that um checkpoint radio became became a reality you know it was uh it, it was just an idea that uh, a couple of us had and um it, you know it, it it really is cool to to watch it grow um we got some really good responses too oh my um, gosh, I, so I guess good. uh I, I don't know i don't know if they listen to to this show as well but i guess uh, uh a couple of people from capcom are listening to, yep, to checkpoint yep, and that's that was, really that was probably one of the coolest ones to hear yeah uh-huh. that's that's really cool so um shout out if uh those capcom folks are also listeners to cool. uh, final encounter cast mm-hmm. yep. um by the way final encounter cast breaking the uh top itunes 100 for uh video games uh video Woo! game podcasts at some point this week and that All was right. even with us having a week off so that's yeah. that's yeah. pretty goddamn cool um, so people in the chat are noticing yes there's no nika or Callie today they are both pregnant but uh you have the important people here you got nate you got me you got chris name a more iconic trio I'll give you a second. Um, well, we are. I mean, in in terms of you know uh, uh, cast members, we are the OGs. We are the OGs. So, yeah, you're in you're in capable hands today. Don't worry, guys. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, again, your support over at Patreon.com/slash Limit Break Radio has uh, made all of this uh, possible, and uh, we really want to thank you. Um, it, you know, uh, one of the things that made the coverage from E three possible uh we had picked up a laptop none of us we realized none of us owned a a laptop with editing software Uh and so that was one of the things that uh we needed to do uh, obviously being removed from the studio and the deadline for the show being thursday morning um and you know i was able to produce the entire show from out in la from our hotel room and uh quite comfortably too so uh that is your you know that's done by your support at uh patreon.com slash limit break radio and we want to thank you uh for all your generous support we're currently sitting just a hair above two thousand dollars uh which does put this show back in the black which is great Mm -hmm. um uh we'd like to be able to keep it there so uh add to your support if you're maybe a new listener to final encounter cast maybe uh you're finding out about the show through checkpoint radio or through limit break radio um you know uh the 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 support starts with the listeners and uh you know we we uh, you know we've said it before we've been quite transparent that you know with checkpoint radio checkpoint radio is on a strictly ad supported model um and you know even though we produce that show uh you know the way that that ends will end up making money varies quite differently from the way that we've been able to get this production company off the ground uh in the first place and that's been through your support um obviously we want to allow for sponsorships and for companies to be able to float the uh, cost of the majority of all of our productions. That's that's sort of an ideal situation. Um, but uh, you know, I, I just I want to say how crucial that that listener support is in getting to that point. Yes, in the in these uh, final stages right here. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, this it, this is a good time whether you're uh, a brand new listener or whether you've been listening for a long time. And, you know, you you like the content, uh, give whatever is uh, comfortable to your budget over at Patreon.com slash Limit Break Radio. It's a monthly gift. Uh, And, uh, yeah, if you can, uh, we ask that, uh, that, you know, you help continue the content into the future. Uh, That being said... Uh, out at E3, you know, talking about E3, uh, I think we did some great networking uh, while we were out there and talked to some very, very smart people mm-hmm. who were really, really receptive to the idea. And uh, you know, we, we uh, one of the I, I'm going to have to grab one. I don't I don't have one here in front of me. But one of the cool things that uh, we had taken out there with us was um, business cards that actually were also USB drives that uh, uh, you know you can plug straight into your 
computer uh-huh. and listen to both episode full episodes and podcasts of the show right then and there. Yeah, huge, um, huge hit. Like, you know, when you told people what we did, they're already a little bit excited. But then when you pulled out those like business USB card things, like people's eyes just lit up. And <laughs> I don't know, in some cases, they might have been more <laughs> excited about the fact that there were business cards with USBs on them somewhere in the world than they were about us. Uh, but yeah, no, it was it was really cool to be able to give those to some people and then come back the next day and now they have a better uh, grasp on exactly what it is we do or exactly how it sounds. So yeah, there so, it is. Yeah, so right there. We, we, went, we went out there armed with these and uh, as you can see, it flips open. Let me see with, that too. Uh, a USB card. And uh, yeah, just you know, one of the one of the things because we were out there both you know covering the event uh, for the show, obviously, as well as um, you know trying to introduce ourselves because it is a it is an industry event. Uh, trying to introduce ourselves to the industry, and uh, hopefully we we made a good impression. Um, we, we really tried to. I think we did. Uh, all of us, you know, all f- uh, all six of us that mm-hmm. were out there uh, were in top forms. So, yeah, I mean, I saw plenty of people, you know, trying to interact and getting, uh, you know, getting the cold short or being brushed off, you know, really quick or just get, getting the usual, you know, rundown and then shoveled off. But all the people that I talked to, and I know all the people that a lot of a lot of us did talk to were very, very interested. Uh, and what was cool is on the very last day when I went around talking to more, I got a lot of, oh, yeah, you know, when you guys came by the other day, they gave me this cool business card. So, yeah. no, I think I think we made great, great, great use of our time. Yeah, I think so, too. So uh, we're going to get into the news here in just a second. Um, I'm sure some of you. You uh, just noticed that light flicker that just happened. Um, so there have been uh, some power issues that have been uh, going on for the better part of now two weeks. And uh, that's something else that, um, you know, uh, your support helps us uh, be able to protect ourselves and our equipment against. Uh, we're going to have to uh, pick up another battery backup unit to make sure that these, uh, uh, you know, these casts are not interrupted by, um, you know, the, the I don't know if this is DTE's problem or if this is the building's problem. Um, but, yep, there it goes yeah. again. <laughs> there it goes again. I can hear my battery engaging. And and the problem is that if it gets, dude, if it gets to a certain point, um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to stop. Like, we're, we're going to actually have to uh, stop live streaming the show and uh, go to low power mode Ugh. and just record this as a podcast, yeah. which really sucks. We don't really want to have to do sucks. that. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we, I was hoping that this problem was going to be uh, completely resolved by the time. After two weeks time? Yeah, yeah you'd think yeah. so. Yeah, by the, by the time that, uh, that, that we came back, obviously it's... It's still an issue, and uh, it, very frustrating and very dismaying to me. Um, you know, th- this is uh, this is something that um, y- you know really stresses me out because you know we have a lot of equipment. Uh, I-, I go to great lengths to make sure that the equipment is uh, well protected, and uh, you know, if-, if that means that unfortunately we have to stop live streaming the show, mm-hmm. it, that that that's that's unfortunately what it means. Um, you know. Uh, uh, if I mean, if it comes down to that, we may. And uh, I, I don't, man, I don't, I don't want to make too many promises here. Um, but we may try to use that new laptop to see if we can just get audio out for mm. Limit Break Radio. I don't know, um, but uh, obviously this is a concern to uh, be able to protect the equipment and uh, something else that we're going to have to invest. Um, you know what you invest in us in. So you know again. Again, in the interest of transparency and just to explain to you guys where where we're sort of at with this thing, I, I'm I'm so stressed out and frustrated by it um, that yeah I, I I don't know I don't I don't really know what to do so uh, we're gonna go uh, to even greater lengths to make sure that the show doesn't get interrupted in uh, you know in future weeks there it is there it is again um, is that what that sound is the yeah. the battery kicking in yeah true oh. yeah it's not good. Um, so I, I mean, I, uh, I'm almost I'm almost tempted to just turn off the lights because that seemed to help, help last. Yeah. It, it seemed to help last week, but it means that the the picture is going to get very very dark for you guys. Um, I, I I I'm not sure what else we can do. Um, but uh, all right, enough enough. You know, talking about the the stresses of uh, trying to get this show back up and running. I don't understand why. 
God damn it. I'm so dismayed by this power issue. Honestly, it, it held out for Limit Break Radio last week. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I was I, I was like, OK, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's uh, it, it's it, you know, it's OK if we don't run the air conditioners, right. you know, during the show, uh, all the air conditioners are off. Yeah. Um, I think it's just the amount of air conditioners that are running in the building. That's, you know, that that's very possible. But like, like you said, two weeks, that's insane. Yeah, I two know. Two weeks with a persistent problem like this and, and no one said anything or looked into it or investigated or anything? Yeah. Well, I, I, well, the thing is, is I called DTE and they said that the power to the building is stable. Uh, I, and, and this happened after a widespread power outage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if the responsibility lies with DTE or if the responsibility lies with the building or if it's just because all of the circuits have greater load that's probably with it, with, with the air conditioners yeah. um I mean, it's been all of really, those are possible but really hot recently <laughs> we're definitely seeing dips in voltage mm-hmm. and uh you know in the interest in the interest of of keeping the equipment safe we uh we may have to shut down but uh let's get through what we can of the news i'm here <clears throat> to do the news tonight. And that's the way the news goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Here's a story that's out of this world. And of course, with Callie being off for the weekend, I get the news duty. So starting off, it has been 18 years since the final episode of Cowboy Bebop aired. And now, a live-action reboot is in the works. Thor screenwriter Chris Yost is adapting the series for TV. But that's really about all the information that we have so far. So... Nate, being a, a, a Bebop fan, that's right, isn't it? You, you've watched Cowboy Bebop. Yeah. Didn't we already get a news story about this? Who should play Spike Spiegel? Um... God, I don't I don't care. <laughs> I think this is going to be awful. I think no matter what it's going to be bad. Uh, they usually are. Yeah, but don't we are we at the point now where we don't even hold out any more hope? Just anytime anything gets adapted, we just automatically put it in the garbage bin for anime? Yes. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I mean, uh, Ghost in the Shell? Yeah. And nothing has been good. I, I can't see this being good. How are they going to be able to do it as stylistically? Well, hold on. But this is, you know, uh, for a TV series instead of a movie, you obviously have a little bit more time to draw out your source material and you don't have to jam everything, you know, really quickly into, uh, you know, a two hour segment. Man, I just, I don't, I. Yeah, it, Diamolus makes a good point. It's basically just Firefly. Like, you, you already have that series. <laughs> it's done. You're done. I'm done. Whenever um, something is Firefly-esque, it's completely not Firefly-esque. So uh, it's garbage. Uh, well, I mean, it, you can't you can't really deny the parallels between Bebop and Firefly. Rocksteady? Firefly. You can. I mean, I can. it is. It, it, I can do it without any basis for Bebop he's, whatever. He's literally and I'm a doing space, it right now. He's literally a space cowboy because it's terrible. Is that the one where he's got like that giant cross on his back and he shoots like the guns? That's Trigun. That's Trigun. Wow, I knew that. Yeah. That's uh, weird. I knew that. Too. Yeah. Pokemon Go is celebrating both their one year anniversary and 750 million downloads with a series of Pokemon Go festivals. The first ever real world festival will be in Chicago on July 22nd with tickets going on sale Monday, the 19th of June. Um, so I've I've heard I, a, a little birdie tells me that uh, Callie is actually planning on going to this. That is true. Yep. I think Callie is officially going for it. Considering... He can get tickets, because because here's what I'm thinking. If they're selling tickets for it, now obviously Pokemon Go isn't as uh, popular now as it was just at launch, right? Mm. But uh, how do you think you see those tickets going? You think it's gonna be one of those you know immediately scooped up within like the first couple hours type deals? I, I, I think I think there's enough of a player base left that is waiting for something like uh, Mew or Mewtwo mm-hmm. or like one of the legendary birds. That yeah, I think that's gonna go pretty quick. Mm-hmm. I know you've been talking about going I have, too. Yeah, uh, I actually. I actually uh, looked into taking time off work. Technically, as the rules at work state, only two people can take any one day off. But I think I might be able to spin this as, uh, look, you know, I, I have to do this thing for for checkpoint because you know it's my work related uh, manager realizes that that's very important to me. So I I, I might be able to do it. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I guess it depends on how quickly the the tickets sell out and, and if I even have a chance to grab one or not. Um, do you think that there's gonna be anything special or exclusive for showing up there? Uh, I'm there ex- has to be a post- Pokemon. I'm, a I'm, legendary ass- I'm Pokemon. assuming. That yeah, there I mean, has I wouldn't think that that you could only get the legendaries at these events. Um, but 
definitely like a like a first look or, or, or first grab at them. No, I'm pretty sure like at these special events that only happen in certain cities, there's going to be a legendary Pokemon that you can only get there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's the same. I, I, it's the same principle as the regional Pokemon, but now it's even sharper in point, even more rare than regional Pokemon. I, I think that they'll probably end up doing a wider release somehow, but that, yeah, yeah for a while, that it'll be exclusive to mm-hmm. being at that event. All right, that's probably fair. Magic the Gathering is officially being adapted into an MMORPG. Oh, Developed by Cryptic Studios and Perfect World, the game has had precious few details released. All we know is it will be both PC and consoles, and that it will be a full-on AAA title, according to Wizards of the Coast. There's no way that this is good. Absolutely not. There's no possible way that this is good. Based on what? Because I mean... Being an MMORPG. Look, Magic the Gathering has a very robust world full of storied history, mythology, More, all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. Like, like, there's definitely stuff to be tapped there. The question is, what does it look like? <sighs> I... I th- I, I mean, have you seen any of the other attempts that uh, that Magic has made at at trying to make a game? Those card, have never been triple A card titles, game though. or no? I, yeah, but I, I just I, uh, yeah, there's a lot to the world, but how much of that world is really that tangible? I I just I don't know. I I don't know. I I I never really like. I played Magic the Gathering for like. Seven years. Ooh, that's long than me. That's a lot. It was a. It, it was yeah. a while. Like I had. I had friends in middle school and high school that played, and it was only in college that I really stopped. Mm-hmm. And you know, I I never really got that that much of a sense of the world like that I, I don't know like I don't think that there's that much world building that's going on uh, well, in Magic and, the Gathering no there is I mean yeah. they, there is quite a bit now they put out uh, yeah, if you books and bef- stuff like that yeah, if you stop before college then Wizards of the Coast have expanded their world building ability far greater than you can possibly imagine uh, I mean, that sounded, that sounded a lot more dramatic than I me- meant it to be. Oh, see, I thought you were looking around because you're like, wow, that made sense. Did I just make a coherent thought? <laughs> no, yeah. never. Um, I, see, I, I just, I don't know. Whatever. I've well, the cryptic I'm, I'm, cryptic studios and perfect world isn't too. too if I'm not that fighting really against Lord of the Pit, then I'm going to be <laughs> really disappointed in this MMO. If I don't get to punch Jace in the stupid face. <laughs> That I don't want to play this game. How does this? How does it actually work? Like, like, because the the isn't the whole concept behind Magic: The Gathering is that you're summoning these different fucking creatures to fight for okay, you? Okay, the premise on your is behalf. You're a planeswalker, right? Okay, and you summon creatures and stuff, right? Okay, so what's 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 the role that you would be assuming? Well, in... you're you're basically like a spellcaster, okay? And right. Spellcasters, you summon creatures, you cast spells. Right. So so if 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 the most interesting parts of the lore that exist are are around what you can summon like that's one really really involved summoning class with an entire world well, th- of shit that I don't understand that is if we are assuming that the gameplay is going to be based on the gameplay of like the cards yeah you're assuming you're going to be a planeswalker you'll probably just be a, a minion in an army or something you get summoned by the planeswalker yeah, you get summoned by that, but that's by what I'm saying yeah cards. like what's what's the hook in here like what's the narrative uh, I, I assume the hook is that because magic consists of so many different planes like in this plane you're in like a uh, sci-fi horror or a sci-fi area or whatever and then this other plane is like a horror with werewolves and stuff and this place is like all about like uh, Greek mythology and stuff so like the idea is like you'll be able to go to like all these different planes and that's interesting you know I think I'm more interested to see how it plays out you're right I don't know if I have any any hope for it actually being a good game or not but it could mix up the genre a bit maybe I, I just want them to just like embrace their card heritage and everyone just has like dual discs on their hands oh, and you, go away. you throw cards down then a creature spawns and go play I don't video. know this 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 sounds yeah. really bad Early design documents for Cyberpunk 2077 have been stolen, according to the game's developer, CD Projekt Red. A ransom demand has been made on the documents, which the company is refusing to pay. They say the documents are largely unrepresentative of what the game actually is now and warns its players to ignore those documents if they're published online. Um, wow. What shady 
goddamn nonsense is this? Like, why... CD Projekt Red does, like, good things in the gaming industry. Why would you want to try to yeah, fuck them? They are the chief export of Poland, isn't that right? Um, I mean... I think it's Norway. Uh, no, it is Poland. It is, it is Poland. It is so, Poland. So, okay, so this happened in Poland. It was, it was probably a pretty good mark. You know, the thieves were like, hey, look, you know, the Witcher's pretty big. You know, they've uh, basically taken our country out of obscurity now, so let's go steal stuff from them. I, I, ugh, I don't know. I, I, I hate this. This, yeah. this makes me sick that that somebody did this um and i i mean i'd love to know about cyberpunk 2077 because it seems really like up my alley mm -hmm. i love well, i these, love these blade. documents are completely unrepresentative of what it is so i, I love blade runner and um you know I've, I've, that's a, it's an aesthetic that i'm super drawn to uh but uh, yeah like I, I now i can't read anything about it until i don't like uh, well, when, uh, when can I now? Like, I can't trust any info about it. That sucks. And uh, I think the fact that the uh, CD Projekt Dead was basically like, you know, go fuck yourselves. Uh, and, and they seem to be pretty we don't confident about the fact that, you know, if these things are published online, that isn't going to give away too much. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's one thing, you know, you can see how games sometimes change dramatically from like pre alpha into the actual game. And this is literally just documents. So. Yeah, and it sucks that they tried to hold him for ransom. <laughs> right. <laughs> GTF. This, this whole idea. I, I, we don't negotiate with terrorists. It's stupid. Like, the idea that you can extort people for information is just, I don't know. It's gross. It's a gro it's a it's a gross notion. It's exploitative and I, 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 I fucking annoying i think and I, but i think cd project red responded to it in exactly oh, yeah. the right way absolutely Let's go fuck yourself mm -hmm. yeah freeze tag inc has released a new mobile app titled garfield go <laughs> while it is location-based treasure hunting ar game what sets it apart is that some of the treasures you find can have real value certain treasures can be redeemed at places like amazon starbucks Domino's, and more i love you best game ever what <laughs> What? Gar Gar Garfield Go. Garfield Go. Yeah, you, you hunt treasure with him. Nailed it! And you can get free shit out you of it. You can get free shit. I mean, that's kind of compa- like- Oh, shit! What are they gonna- I mean, do you get to win a Garfield t-shirt that has been sitting in a warehouse since 1984? Maybe maybe from Amazon, but like Starbucks and Domino's? That, that sounds like free coffee and pizza. Yeah, come on. Get a, a unicorn frappuccino. It's probably lasagna flavored. Uh, see, I, I like. I, I hope it's just general credit, th so that I could buy whatever I want. Cause, Pro yeah, probably. Because because you can find some really kind of like weird, obscure holes of of Amazon. So like, if I could take the credit from Garfield Go, and buy, you know, a thematically but weird uh, uh, gift for myself, like a crucified Odie doll, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> Right, like Gar Garfield uh, would yes, appreciate yes, that, right? Yes, like, I, yes. I think Garfield would be like, yeah, that, I'm okay with that. Or like, I don't know, like ten pounds of lasagna, uh, you know, like like a, like a Stouffer's family pack. Yeah, something like that. That he eats all by himself, though. <laughs> in sadness, it gets in his beard. It's still not beefaroni, though. Yeah, one step above. <laughs> That's so fucking weird. <laughs> all right, so this next one, this is for you, Nate. Uh, uh, Konami is reportedly blacklisting and going after its former employees, particularly Fuck one, Konami, ones man. who have gone to work for Kojima Productions. They've made it clear that ex-employees cannot put their time at Konami on their public resumes and will not give them favorable Holy recommendations. Shit. Yeah! That's not all. That's not all. So uh, Kojima Productions, now that it is, uh, uh, you know, either, I, I don't know if it's a contractor of of Sony or if it's now actually a subsidiary of mm -hmm. Sony, but um, Kojima Productions applied for health insurance and the board that he like uh, whoever you have to apply to to get health insurance for your company. Uh, one of the guys that sits on the executive board also sits on the executive board of Konami and wouldn't you know it. <laughs> Kojima Productions is being refused. Yeah, they're not eligible for health insurance, guys. Sorry. Why? What? That's so what? Fucked. What the fuck? 
fuck? Like that's going beyond just giving the middle finger to 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 Kojima. Yes. There, there's people that are working for him that need health insurance, yeah. and you're blocking them out. Yep. What the hell? Yeah. The, 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 I mean, you talk about fighting a dirty, dirty fight. That is dirty as fuck. How do you even get off? Uh, Freezing. <laughs> Can you even I, do that? I, I mean, they are. How but, fucked like, up is that? What's, like, the, what's the basis for rejecting them? Um, I don't. I don't know. This this came out of a Nikkei report that uh, I've seen. You know, translations of, but have not really necessarily totally been able to to understand or comprehend myself. Um, so I, I I can't say for certain, but um, you know, I think that uh, <laughs> this is definitely uh, uh, super fucked up and uh, a, a weird situation. Um, and I mean, fucking. How does Konami come out of the other side of this trying to still sell a product that any gamer will buy? Well, they're they're not. Uh, I'm, I they're mean, they're not true. selling gamer products. You're right. Just pachinko you're, machines. You're right. You're what right. about Mel Your Solid Survive? Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Well, well we're going to play that's that the, game. That's, that's, that's their one pass. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it, it's totally insane. I mean, that's that's abuse. That is clear abuse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how long is this whole, like, Konami going after Kojima thing supposed to go on for? Uh, I mean... <laughs> Until he dies. Yeah, forever? <laughs> this is it's ridiculous. That, I mean, clearly clearly Konami's got an axe to grow. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, Nate, you had actually uh, found uh, Never Be Game Over, those, those uh, you know, forums around the, the theories and, and, yes. and whatnot behind Metal Gear Solid, that there were some people that were floating this idea that the whole, you know, split between uh, Konami and Kojima was like, it's planned. Was this, a, it was this a ruse. secret thing, yeah. And, and they were still trying to push that, like even a couple of days before this Nikkei yeah. report. Yeah. And then with this hit, you're like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> oh, this, okay. Like this is going to a whole nother level to sell that. Where it's like, you know what? The people who work for you, they don't get health insurance. Right. Fuck them. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question. Can can uh, employers say you can't put us on your resume? Is that a thing? Um. <sighs> I wouldn't think. So, not unless you've signed some type of... Yeah, depending of, on yeah. your contract. If that's but, written into your contract. But if it's not written in, they can't just come and be like, oh, you guys, you can't put that on there Yeah, anymore. that doesn't... Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, to be fair, none of this seems legally enforceable. Oh, yeah, no. no. <laughs> like, not, not... Well, okay, hold on, but this is in Glorious Nippon Ichi Land, so... <laughs> Of course, because the, the the only thing that they can really do, and 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 uh, you know, this is kind of where the threat I think comes from, is that if you do put it there, and you know, then your whoever you're applying for reaches out to them, they're not going to give you a favorable recommendation. So I don't know. I mean, at this point, would you want to put Konami on your resume? Okay, well, you can explain that. Be like, have a little asterisk right there, and say, hey, uh, I work there, but there's some shit going down between them and. Kojima, uh, but they're going out of their way to badmouth their their ex employees. Yeah. Like, imagine, imagine if your last employer called your current employer and went, "Hey, you know that fat guy you have working for you? He's a real asshole." Okay, but that's kind of different because that's like small. But this is like, like in the video game industry, everyone should know about what Konami is doing against their ex employees. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I, but I so. think I think that's kind of the point of of so us they, talking about it and 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 people doing articles about it is that so people know. Yeah. Okay. So like, I feel like at that point you can't really put any any stock into what Konami says about their ex employees. Well, and and consider the position that this puts Hideo Kojima in. I mean, if you if you felt a responsibility to your employees and to your staff and to your team before, now that you know that your former boss is going out and actively campaigning against you, I, I mean, I, I I Kojima has got to feel very defensive about his team, about anyone who's who's working with or who ha uh, who has worked with Kojima Productions in the past. I would. I mean if 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 you know, god forbid if if you know, we split from Westwood 1 for some reason and Westwood 1 started actively campaigning against I any of any of you guys, you know, I would take that pretty personally. Mm -hmm. Um so it, it's it's sort of a a similar situation there. And I I think that that's really unconscionable uh, uh you know, from the part of of Konami. I, I, from an entire company, it's yeah, ridiculous. I, I, 
I genuinely think at this point that um, Konami needs to hang it up. Like, Konami <laughs> needs to... For their own sake, get for their out, image and their brand? They need to get out of the games industry. Like, they need to stop trying to present themselves as a gaming company. They they should drop all of their IPs. They should sell them. I there mean, you go. I, so I mean honestly, die. yeah, they should sell their their IPs off. Um, you know, so they they get a little bit of money and just focus on your stupid fucking pachinko machines and and you know, trying to capture a gambling market because you're you, you obviously uh are wasting the talent that is existing there. Now, I mean that that also creates a culture uh, of of any who is thinking about jumping ship from Konami now is they've got to feel stuck. They've got to feel stuck because they're like, dude, if Konami, you know, talks shit about all of these other super talented people, like, what if I leave? Like, well, yeah, I mean, imagine you've been working there for 15, 20 years and you're allowed to put that on your resume now. So what? You're going to go apply to companies. Well, what would you do for these 15, 20 years? Right. Eh. Yeah. That's it's, supposed just, to say. it's just awful. Yeah. Terrible. IO Interactive has completed negotiations with Square Enix, and they will be becoming an independent studio. In addition, they've retained all rights to their Hitman franchise. The developer is lauding the peaceful transition and is expre as expressing excitement to regain total creative control over the game. Um, uh, kind of surprised me that uh, Square Enix I, let them off with, with the full IP. Um, I don't know. Have you uh, ever played any of the Hitman games? No. No? No. Okay. Uh, to Have be you? fair, no. I haven't. I actually have the full collection on Xbox. It was on uh, Xbox Gold one oh, time. Oh, the Xbox One X? <laughs> so I was able to get them, but no, I never had a chance to uh, to jump into them. But I mean, I have a lot of friends that, you know, really speak very, very well of the series. I don't know what's happened to it, you know, recently for it to kind of go downhill. I think the episodic, uh, the uh, uh, Square Enix trying to make it episodic uh, uh, was a big, 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 big blow to the franchise. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine for the Final Fantasy VII remake. <laughs> Uh, well, I, 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 I'm going to say that that whole Final Fantasy VII remake is probably in, m m you know, bigger. Never going to happen. It's in bigger flux than we know. Yeah, I think we know plenty how much uh, flux it's in. I don't know. I think the Square Enix is looking to top the fiasco that was FF15. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Oh. Go big. How? How? Go big. How? 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 <laughs> so they're going to have a movie about Final Fantasy VII? They already did that. They, yeah, that's mm. that's happened. A second one. That's how they top it. <laughs> I I don't know. I just I think that that before FF7 actually hits the market, there's going to be some really insane shit that ends up coming out that we're going to have the uh, the pleasure of reporting on. Mm -hmm. All right. So in <laughs> this next one, I just want to say that there is no bias here whatsoever. I did not write this. And a news story so horrifying it made Callie call in. Bubsy is officially returning. Titled Bubsy, the Wooly Strike Back. Accolade has apparently decided there's a whole new generation of kids' lives to ruin, and so the game will launch on Steam and PS4 in fall 2017. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's I awesome. I mean, I'm really I sad that Callie isn't here for this. Yeah, we we tried to get him a hands on with with Bubsy <laughs> at E three. I don't think that they were represented. No, I don't think they were. Yeah, I even reached. I out think to we're like, going to have to make that a goal next year. Though. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Def well, I mean, fall two thousand seventeen. It's going to be out oh, before yeah, then. It's going to be out this year. Yeah. Oh, he's going to so, stream it. I think. Oh, is he going to oh, stream yeah, it? I was going to say because oh, okay, there we go. You're going to force him to play it on air if not. He, there we go. He was totally excited to play. He said he was going to stream it verbatim. Those words. I don't. I, it can anyone terrible. explain it? Like it looks terrible. It looks just as bad as it did yeah. when it was a stupid game. I know. It's like like did the creators just decide? You know, what, let's save up our money to release another bad game. Yeah. Like like Pretty much. third time's a charm. I don't. I don't. I don't understand why they keep. To be fair, the same thing keeps happening with Toe Jam and Earl after the first game too. <laughs> what? It, it, there was yes. more than one. <laughs> yeah, no, there was a lot. Like there was, I think there was four at oh this point. Oh my god! Uh, there was one on Xbox. Yeah, it oh. like it just. Oh. And oh. the thing is, is that the first one was so cool and quirky, but it never needed a sequel. It never need. We never ever needed to go back there. And it's just like like people love the idea of Toe Jam and Earl more than they actually want to. 
play the fucking game. Well, see, that's what I don't understand. Like, Accolade, you know, these these are people who are within the industry. I assume they play other games. So what makes them think that Bubsy, which failed just, you know, before in similar iterations of what we're getting now, like, do they just think, okay, I think the world's ready to return to this type of, like, yeah, platform it's, it's, gaming it's at large? It's nostalgia culture eating its own tail. But this, it's not even good nostalgia. <laughs> no, no. I mean, w- listen, we're in... <laughs> It's 2017. We're in the days of Trump and fin- fidget spinners. Like, what the fuck do you want from hey, from anyone anymore? Don't put fidget spinners in with Trump, okay? I'll do whatever the fuck I want. Uh, I-, I mean, honestly, like, the bar set so low. Like, no one's trying. No one gives a shit anymore. Like, clearly, everyone's phoning it in. Oh, we're at the point where we're re- recycling Bubsy? Yep, all right. It's We're just... You know what? Final encounter cast has three hosts on it. Fuck it. <laughs> you know what? Let's start. Let's start watering our crops with Gatorade and just turn the whole fucking thing into idiocracy. Okay, well, like it. Just why not? Yeah, that's yeah. where we're at. Clearly, that's where that's that's the logical extension of all of this. So fuck it. That's where we're going. Thanks, Bubsy. That's what we have to look forward to. Is you are. I, you know what? When when civilization falls. When civil when 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 society comes to its screeching grinding violent halt, I'm gonna blame Bubsy. I Researchers th- will look back on time and say Bubsy is when the world turned. Yep. Yeah. Uh did my mic stop working? Uh my, my, my I don't know. Test test. You guys hear me? No. No. What the heck? That's weird. Yeah, very weird. Huh. That's odd. How, how do I do the... Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, that was man, that was really weird. That okay. was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, Force Hacks, a popular GTA online cheating tool, has been taken down by Take-Two Games. In addition to taking down the paid cheat tool, Take-Two has insisted that the, the, the developer donate all of its proceeds to charity. They have agreed and have taken down the tool. Uh, this is fucking horseshit. This is fucking now. Hold on, don't don't confuse this because uh, the the there there was an uh, another oh, one. Oh, this is the yes. paid GTA online. Yes. Okay, yeah, yep. no, this that's, was this an is actual good. online <laughs> cheating. This tool. is bullshit. Now, I want to keep cheating in GTA Five. <laughs> what the fuck? Now, uh, uh, why why these two stories aren't together, or why why the other one isn't even on isn't here? On here, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, um, Take Two has been going after uh, a lot of mods. For, open for, Open Six is. Is the is the one that you were thinking of. right? Yep. Yes, Which is, and, uh, and this is one that does not impact online play in the slightest. Uh, no, not n- open four or open, open six. Open four was open four. Oh, yeah, I think uh, it's open four. The reason that they actually finally did take it down because uh, this has actually been going for ten years now, and all of like the really really big modders uh, use it to put all kinds of great awesome things into it. Right, is that there was actually a small subset of people that were using it for cheating purposes. I I I don't. I, what, is, what is open four or six or whatever? It's, it's a tool that people can use to mod GTA uh, five. Yeah, they they use it for it's creating like a scripting program or something. Yeah, they they use it for like creating a machinima for doing like all kinds. Of, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen the video of like the guy on the bike on the plane who like flies or on the yeah who flies off and does all these crazy tricks through the air and then ends up landing black back on a plane or whatnot. They do all kinds of like crazy physics type stuff. There's uh, some YouTubers whose content is solely gta 5 mods yeah and it's been used for 10 years and take two has given them a cease and desist um and and again yeah 10 years worth of development 10 years worth of uh uh take two not uh taking any kind of action against this and rockstar uh openly kind of promoting them you know that's that's i think the thing that that sits the 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 most uncomfortably with me is that rockstar uh, like had no problem with uh with this specific mod tool and and so why is take two going after take five open four open, open four um I, it, again in, in in the article they mentioned that there is some people who have been using it for illicit purposes but because this represents such a i don't huge, know i don't know how well, much okay. of that is but if it was true if that's the reason why wouldn't you then work with open four to just find a way to get rid of those specific ones because 10 years worth of you know a, a community built mod driven uh, uh, movement is is insane. Apparently, already on Steam, GTA Five has tanked out. Oh yeah, uh, people are tons, so upset over tons this. of negative reviews. And uh, I, I mean, the, the they 
take two is force the developer to put uh, an uninstall notice. Like uh, if yep. you try mm-hmm. to uh, run the tools now, um, you know, I, I, it's just I, I don't I don't under this. This seems to be a bigger shift, a bigger attitude shift that's happening within the industry mm. that is both anti-consumer and anti but you know mod and and media right <laughs> like that is a, a, a that seems to be a big uh, uh sweeping attitude change because you know um remix scenes uh youtube's you know youtube channels twitch uh personalities you know um the, the, it seems like game companies will trot us out on stage to you know help with their e3 presentations or you know um uh, you know use those personalities when it suits them yeah but now there there does seem to be this this um you know second side to it which you know and i and i i don't mean to sound like i i knew that this was happening or, or you know that this uh, you know that i'm smarter than anyone else but because of uh uh you know the amount of time that i've spent studying media and media law i was aware that this sort of like other shoe was going to drop mm-hmm. eventually that the fact that game companies have been you know so permissive with their intellectual property and letting third party uh you know outlets either use them or publish them or work them into their product is not something that is i mean it it defies the rest of uh you know um uh creative intellectual property right, right, and, and right. all of that so it, it defies all of those conventions and it, it was only it's only a matter of time before you know the uh, variety of approaches become so wide that you start, you know, you start having the channels you find problematic yeah. or, you know, whatever it is like it, there's there's so many different ways that um, as a game publisher or a game developer, you could, uh, you know, want to enforce or protect your intellectual property and you know for years it was just uh, you know it was sort of all treated as you know it's all promotion then right, it's all right it's exactly. all done for yeah you know uh the uh, positive the, reason. the creators of open for two had stated that it, had they taken them to court they could probably you know obviously through like fair use and stuff like that they could have won and got the cease and desist uh reversed but they said the money and the time that they're just tired of it and it's it's not worth it anymore yeah. which i think is most heartbreaking of all i i i, I agree that that is heartbreaking that it and it and it's got to be frustrating for that developer too i mean especially because i think that they you know came out and said like look we'll do whatever we need to yeah to to change you know be specific with what you want us to change so that we can still make this tool viable and take to just you know summarily and by the way i guess the um the way that the cease and desist was written was was terrible as well so it was just like this shoddily written poor excuse for uh cease and desist and i don't know that the whole the whole thing is just disappointing yeah Nintendo has responded to Hungrybox's call out of their practices when it comes to supporting the esports community. They have said that while they are running an occasional tournament, it is their hope to keep Nintendo esports a grassroots phenomenon. Uh, so w- hang on. Uh, it go. Uh, so so we had re- uh, reported on a uh, a story uh, uh, a ways back about a Smash player, Hungrybox, who at a tournament had basically called out Nintendo, saying, "Look, you know, this is more than just uh uh you know uh, a game for." Or you know these these occasional tournaments or whatever like like this is a lifestyle. Did right? we report on? I don't remember covering this. I don't I don't remember actually. You know, it might have been on Checkpoint. I I don't think we even talked about it on Checkpoint. I think it, it happened like the day that we did a Checkpoint and we never even covered it. I think you're actively dreaming right now. No, it might have been in, in, in just the news segment. That, do you, that do you smell covered. toast? No, we definitely no. Nope. We, uh, All right, well, it, it, we definitely have not covered this. In that case, butter. Hungry Box won a Smash tournament, and then in his victory speech, basically called out Nintendo for not supporting Smash, especially with the way that they've been pushing Splatoon and Arms and whatnot, and said like, you know, we're here, we're not going anywhere. This is a uh, uh, a lifestyle for us, and there are people who are very, very passionate about it. At E3, someone had actually played the speech for 
Reggie. And you'll hear a lot of good things to say about Hungrybox, who's actually uh, been in a Nintendo sanctioned tournament before. So, like, you know, they, they've met. Says he's, uh, you know, very proud of what the Smash community has done, uh, that he, you know, they're a very passionate fan base, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they want uh, the Smash scene to remain grassroots. And then follow up with saying, I'm not really sure how they want us to help. Um, I, I mean, which I think was like the weirdest thing because then they had actually reached out to Hungrybox again and goes, "Did you have any ideas?" And he's like, "Yeah, actually," and had like five really great points. And it's just like Nintendo's just in like this really weird place with a lot of what they do. Every decision they make just seems so inconsistent with really anything. Yeah, and uh, and again, I think that the uh, you know the Smash community and and sort of rightfully so uh, was uh, you know kind of kind of waiting with bated breath mm-hmm. for uh, an announcement of some kind of Smash game on the Switch out at oh, E3. Honey, you don't uh, get Smash Brothers first year. Um <laughs> And and but I think that that's problematic, especially with with the way that esports as a concept is is really starting to lift off. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that's where I think Nintendo is really being short sighted. Is that they have an opportunity to really take themselves into a competitive space, and no one's going to take you seriously if the product that you're offering to get there is arms yeah and and through in the interview too what it seemed like reggie and and, and nintendo i think is really wary of is they don't want to be the people who are in charge of you know the organizing or in charge of the tournaments themselves they don't want to be the lead yeah but how fucking often does a developer take that role it's really not that often Mm -hmm. i I think you're blizzard i I mean riot I, i think i think as as the the developer and the publisher of the game that you are inherently responsible for a few things and that is supporting the game to the most current hardware possible uh you know making sure that the 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 characters are balanced and competitive and that you're responding to your community uh you know and and specifically your competitive community with ways to improve mechanically and uh the you know the third is um uh, you know just it's setting some expectations for the way that tournaments are administered. I think that's been one of the big things that we've heard about the Smash community yes. is that the way that tournaments are currently administered is a little, not just a little, but all over the place. There's something going every single fucking weekend and it's overwhelming and it's overwhelming for pros. It's overwhelming for organizers um, and and you know coming in and and setting some standards or saying you know uh uh like i i mean it's just you know you can do very very light things mm-hmm. um but at, primarily i think your role is to provide your player base with access to the game. Now, I, I think I, now, Chris, Chris, you you had that that very smug little. Oh, you don't get Smash first year. This is where uh, this is where Nintendo cannot afford to be fucking Nintendo at this point mm-hmm. because if they sit on their hands because they think that oh well in two more years Smash will really sell like gangbusters they're not wrong but at the same time like all of this opportunity for the the growth of esports is happening right underneath them and if they ignore it they'll miss out on it and I, I I, look, you say what you will, uh, Reggie, about, um, y- you know, well, we don't really know what to do. I, I, y- you know how much money is floating around esports and how much potential and how much attention is floating around esports. Uh, the fact that you're not a player in it, being Nintendo, um, outside of Smash, is kind of pathetic. Like, I think that it's, you know, really sad that the thing that you think is going to take off is fucking Splatoon. Or Go arms. F- yeah, like, that's, that's, that's almost embarrassing. Like, as a developer... Uh, you know, and and especially after seeing arms in person, what it uh, like? What an embarrassment of a game! <laughs> like that's not even a game. That's a demo. That should have been on that fucking demo disc, and and it should not be a, a title that we're getting three months out of launch. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like I that you're paying sixty bucks for. Dude, oh my god! What? Dude, I assume. 
I mean, <laughs> Nintendo, Nintendo, I think, is really having some big missteps in the first quarter of uh, of the launch of the Switch. And it makes me wonder, OK, well, if your lineup is this bad for this long, why did you rush the product out? Why did you get it out to market? Was it just to sell a whole bunch of copies of Breath of the Wild? Because, I mean, I, you know, was it were you trying to make yourself relevant in the conversation for a while? Because you definitely did that. But now what's your fucking plan? We saw none of that at E3 and I think anyone who's a Nintendo fan should be fucking frustrated at this point and not smug like they're blowing a huge opportunity and you know if you just leave it to oh well it's just Nintendo bullshit that's I I can't accept that line of logic anymore they're smarter than this they half ass everything basically they they really do I mean like oh cool put your hat on a fucking frog you're a frog great who gives a shit the fact that at their actual treehouse event at E3 people were confused on where this new Pokemon RPG was going to be or if it was Pokemon and it wasn't until several news sources later and a quote from the president of Pokemon that we realized oh Pokemon will be on the switch just shows how much of a fucking mess they are oh the whole thing is a goddamn nightmare it's it's a it's a it's a mess from top to bottom um and and I don't see it getting any better and no. and and I feel bad for Nintendo fans that you know have invested money in a system that isn't going anywhere and I feel bad for smash pros that are basically completely unsupported by the community that or by the company that uh, makes the game yeah. you don't have to feel bad we're used to it by now I mean you guys are just so indoctrinated. you don't even realize it like you just yeah. eat you just eat whoa, 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 up. hold on what you don't think I don't realize that I just wasted a whole bunch of money on a Switch? I, you might, but I think at large, everyone's like, oh, no, totally happy with my Switch. Yeah. Look at all these games coming out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I th- I mean, between Mario Odyssey and uh, Mario and Rabbids, you know, it it uh, the Nintendo fans seem sated. And, and, yeah. and you know, Metroid this, Prime 4 ah, yeah, and, and, and announced. And, and, and here's the thing is that <laughs> titles and words, uh, you know, and this has been this has been Norris's point uh, on on Checkpoint a couple of times. And, and I, I, I happen to agree with him. The that fact that Nintendo fans were sated by, you know, the 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 little bit of Mario Odyssey that was shown off, even though it is cool. And, you know, there there is definitely some some positives to, um, you know, to talk about with Mario Odyssey. The fact that Mario Odyssey, uh, Mario and Rabbids, uh, the just the mere announcement of a Pokemon game coming sometime in the foreseeable future and fucking Metroid was enough to get it done for you. Like how like honestly, like how and it wasn't even presented in like a spectacular fashion either. It was just like, all right, guys, here's the here's the thing. What kind of Stockholm syndrome? do you have to have <laughs> to to make that translate in your head to like oh yeah nintendo tore up e3 oh my god yeah people that were telling me that i'm like are you kidding me really yeah they tore it up did they i mean d- d- there was an interview that they're went bringing out. back they're bringing back metroid by the way a series that hasn't been good for what four games yeah so it's not going to be good again guys what what are the chances that they're going to fuck it up again Pretty good, right? 95%. Pretty good? Okay. 95%. All right. Uh, all right. Mm-hmm. Was there any game since Metroid Prime 3? I think they just abandoned it, didn't they? Yeah, because it was okay. terrible. Okay, see? It's not that we had, they had four really bad games. It's that they just didn't have games, right? I don't know. I'm not a Metroid fan. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Nintendo sucks. Yeah. Bronson. Duh. <laughs> Bron- In case anyone didn't know. Bronson Tran, the mouth of NorCal, was competed in the E3 Tekken 7 tournament and found himself nominated the MVP via Twitter. The prize was said to be a T-Mobile phone, which Bronson turned down because he already uses AT&T. And uh, didn't want to switch his carrier, so instead he plans to give this phone away to a Twitter fan. No. Lol. What? I mean, I guess. Okay. Why is this on the news? Yeah, I don't understand why this is a news story. Because <laughs> he turned down a prize that he won? Oh. It's a... I mean, it's a f- <laughs> phone. Gay! It's Was a it a good f- phone? I mean, yeah. I would like, hope. Does this phone suck your balls too? Like, well, if that was the case, I th- I would have switched carriers for that. I prefer it's just cock sucking. Like, ball I, sucking gets a little weird. No, <laughs> okay, that's fair. Did no one pre-read these? Uh, apparently not. Apparently, apparently, Callie is still fucking out to E3 <laughs> because I don't know what the fuck this story was hey, supposed to he be. He passed out in the shower. I, you know what? I passed. He passed out on the toilet. I passed out. 
on the to- and here's the here's for the over an hour here's <laughs> for over an hour here's the really disturbing part is that I don't remember having shit but when I got up when I woke up there was shit in the bowl okay see <laughs> you were just planning I don't I. Uh, that when that one pa- could, well, but <laughs> when you had passed out, you were shitting. So luckily, you were on the toilet. But that's that's the th- like. If, did, wait, hold on. Do you remember going to the toilet? I, I, I mean, I remember waking up on the toilet. <laughs> so, so maybe you were like passed out, sleepwalking to the sleep toilet, shitting, Sli- sleep shitting. Uh, all, all I know, uh, look, I. I I got very accustomed to to sleeping sitting up on <laughs> planes and and I just I feel Your like toilet I, is a similar thing to a plane? I, I, no, I just Did you I, shit on the plane? No. Are you sure? I mean maybe, I don't know. <laughs> did I? I don't think Robbie? I, did. I I don't I don't think I don't, you did. I don't no. think did I did. you smell it? I mean, I think I think if I did, most everyone would have known. Yeah, because you have to like get up and let everybody out and then get back. To in be fair, I barely eat when I travel. Like I I I, I fucking I, the tension is is yeah. so bad that I he sits I, down, his earbuds go in, then he go he at least looks catatonic. Um, so uh, you know, like there was not that much shitting, but when I came home, I ate like a fucking horse, and apparently shit like a fucking horse too while asleep. While asleep, standing up. That is actually kind of probably how horses shit. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, I don't think they sleep. It's shit sleeping though. I uh, right? I, how would you know? How would you know? Look at honestly. How would you know? Well, horses sleep laying down. No. Do they? They, they can Don't sleep, they? They can sleep standing up as well. Yeah, I thought so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because when they're in the stable, they can yeah. they can sleep. So, yeah, they can stand, sleep, and shit all at the same time. Well, okay, hold on. Just because a horse can stand and sleep and stand and shit does not mean they can stand, shit, and sleep. That's three things at once. Do you, I don't think I mean clearly I have proved that you do not have to have an active nervous system to to <laughs> well, shit. Yeah, but you're also not a horse for starters. You're a lot smarter than a horse, presumably. Yeah. Uh, okay. Actually, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's a horse in the world that's smarter than you. I, I, I think I think point. actually the, uh, the the fact that we're cognizant like of 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 you know human being like we hold our shit for a purpose. A horse doesn't know to hold its shit. Doesn't hold it shit. It ever. could just okay, be automatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not it true. doesn't even know. That's not true. I mean, horses could be trained to shit outside only and not shit in the pen. That is, uh, that is not. I've never seen that ever in my life. How I've never many even horses heard have you that. interviewed? I, I mean, how many? How many? How many horses have you interviewed personally? <laughs> how many ha- have you? Zero. That's why I don't know. I'm not making the claim that horses can't be trained to shit outside. Okay, okay, okay. Guys, look, look. We just recently got in the top 100 video game podcast on Apple, okay? Let's... Yeah, now we're shooting for the top 100 horse yeah. podcast. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, our last story. This segment brought to you by Horse Apples. <laughs> the ESA has announced that the attendance for E3 this year is way up. The official number comes in at 68,400 up from last year's 50,300. Now, this, of course, includes the 15 thousand public expo badges that were sold before the event um i i i have nothing to compare it to but it definitely felt busy there were a lot there was yeah. a lot of people holy crap um i feel like it felt like there were more than just fifteen thousand attendants like yeah really? yeah because um, i would have thought without them the lines would have been a lot smaller but if there were still another fifty thousand people there yeah they give media they badges to anybody not that's not true they gave them to fusion <laughs> i mean fair they gave them to us. We I were know, there, but we have credentials. Yeah. Well. Okay. They gave it to Kooky before she had real credentials. Uh, I saw a guy from Curse Gaming that did not have a media badge. He just had a normal badge, and he brushed me off. What a dick! I know. Damn it, Curse. Did you? I mean, like you, you like tried to introduce. Yeah. Well, oh. he was also like talking to someone too, so kind of like edging was kind of like waiting, and then when they were done, I went to like introduce myself. And he just kind of walked off, and I was like, dick. I nobody saw that. What a dick. <laughs> But now everybody knows. Yeah. What a now everybody knows. What yeah. a dick. Fallen. Fallen. Um. All right. So, uh, yeah, this a good transition. Maybe one of the only ones in this new segment. Uh, into uh, talking about E3. Uh, we are finally back from E3. Um. First of all, I it took me two two full days to recover to to even start feeling human. Virgo is completely gone now. Not totally, but mostly. Like I, I'm still catching uh, waves of vertigo, especially mm-hmm. um, now that you know, like the studio is getting a little bit warmer. Um, you know, I'm I'm definitely starting to feel it a little bit more. But uh, 
yeah, I was I was getting bad bad waves of vertigo until uh, probably about midnight last night. Um, let's see. Uh, I I was I, I mean I was just I I I think I slept like twenty hours once we got back. Like I was just useless. Yeah, at one point he had put in a little chat. He's like, "All right, guys, I woke up and got a sandwich, and I'm going to go die." Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, Norris ended up visiting the hospital. I don't think it was anything. St- too serious. No, but, but he he got yeah. he got he got a bug, uh, mm-hmm. you know, while traveling. Yeah, I think it was me and Kooky were the only ones that once we got back were 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 pretty fine, easily adapted back into uh, normal life. Yeah, that's because you're always always sounding like sick and terrible with your stupid allergies. It was Norris this time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. So uh, again, we had uh, we had a great time while we were out at E3. Uh, by the way, I want to encourage everyone to stick around following Limit Break Radio. Uh, to hear uh, Checkpoint Radio's uh, coverage of E3 2017. Power pending. Um, we've also got the uh, the podcast that is available that was sort of like our general thoughts and wrap-up mm-hmm. uh, from the show floor. Uh, you can find that over at CheckpointRadio.com. That's the uh, Checkpoint Radio podcast from Westwood One. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, E3 2017, uh, this was our first E3 um, you know, uh, I, obviously we've we've covered it from, uh, you know, remotely in the past and uh, our first time actually getting to go out there. Um, the first thing is, is that it is bigger, but it is also smaller than I thought. Like it, it when you get there, it is it does seem very big and overwhelming and um, confusing, but uh, all credit to the way that the convention laid everything out yes. and, and spaced everything out between two different halls mm-hmm. um, because by the end of the first day, I felt like everything was was navigable. I, I got a very good lay of the land. I knew um, you know where I wanted to be uh, to, to record the wrap-ups. I knew what booth I wanted to hit and yeah, yeah. No, how to get there, there. There was no wasted space, right? I mean, there was a lot there, but it was all condensed very precisely. Right. Everything had its place. You know, everything was utilized to the utmost. And 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 you're right. Like it was really easy to sort of walk around and see or look at everything. Right. But you know, obviously taking lines and stuff into consideration, actually interacting with everything, that that was a whole other monster. Now I have to especially hand it to Sony because they basically had all Sony slash Nintendo related stuff in one hall and then everything else was in the other hall. The Sony hall, holy crap. Like everything in there was like a finely oiled machine the way that it was running. All the way down to like people who had these giant signs on that said, you know, line starts here or ask, you know, how to get in line, blah, 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 stuff like that. Whereas in some of the other ones, I was like, all right, is this a line to play the game? Is it a line to get a picture? Ubisoft has a line to get into their line. Like some parts of it were a little, little hectic. uh, Yeah, there were definitely some smaller booths that were uh, understaffed. Um, I know that uh, Square Enix, the uh, beginning of the second day, we were hanging out in line. I think we we stood in the Stormblood line for about an hour, hour yeah, and a half. About that. Uh, we had the. Uh, I, I had to peel off to to go for uh, Bandai Namco and uh, a, a very cool presentation from mm-hmm. them. Um, you know, we got to hear about uh, Dragon Ball Fighters, which uh, I I still think is probably uh, the most impressive game that I saw out at E3. Um, but we also got to hear about Project uh, Project Cars, I believe it's called Project, Project Cars, Cars 2. Two, and. Uh, uh, there was another. Oh, uh, Nino Kuni too, mm-hmm. um, which uh, I, I, you know, I never played the first Nino Kuni. I knew that was wildly popular. Uh, it, it was, and and I know that um, you know a lot of people had a lot of fun with it. Uh, very cutesy, you know, Studio Ghibli uh, inspired. They actually hired a lot of former Studio Ghibli employees no, that's cool. for the staff of that game. Um, and the second one, you know, looks to continue th- that. You know, looks to continue that on. Very beautiful you know again it looks like a, you're playing a studio ghibli film which automatically that's mm-hmm. the hook that's the hook right then and there um it, it's i think it's a little bit probably too cutesy for me to actually like ever non-ironically give a <laughs> shot like i don't know that i could actually do it and take it seriously um but uh yeah i, I was i was impressed with what i saw um Project uh, Project Cars Two 
was uh, was was one. God, I was so impressed with that. I'm not a, I'm not a racing fan, mm-hmm. um, but their attention to detail in terms of environments and tracks was something that I've actually never seen in games before. Um, they talked about how you know uh, they they added dynamic weather into the game and w- how normally that is really just kind of a binary decision between um, you know are you uh, uh, equipping rain slick tires or are you equipping um, you know more dry tires for mm-hmm. grip and uh, what he said was is that it, you know there's this is actually different where you know when rain activates there are certain sections of the track that will puddle and and it's actually they reach a certain saturation point before that puddle forms and you you see that puddle graphically represented and when you drive through it like it actually impacts the way well yeah if anyone's driven like on a rainy day you know when you hit a giant puddle there there's changes to the way that 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 physics yes yeah and so it's it it becomes more than uh you know much more than just a binary Mm -hmm. decision and uh i was really really interested by that level of detail and design in an environment because you know one of the things that i think is really interesting um that that uh, you know I, maybe maybe this didn't even click until e3 was that is that games that have a much tighter focus or are a genre specific game can do much more with that focus in terms of environment than maybe say an open world I game. I understand what you're saying. That can yeah. then end up translating to an open world game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the w- w- I think one of the best examples that I can draw is the way that Metal Gear Solid Three, even though it wasn't an open world game, the way that it approached its level design, the way that it approached uh, you know certain mechanics like scouring for food, um, you know, and 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 having natural booby traps and things like that was <laughs> was was something that carried on to uh, uh, every other open game world thereafter. game yeah, yeah. really uh, uh, every game world mm-hmm. there there after and uh yeah i i think that you know something like project cars 2 it, you know um it, it, by driving that concept i i think that you know just down the road as we add more processing power as we add more abilities as we add more functions and add more variables to game worlds that it just ends up making these worlds feel much more alive you know i actually saw a great example of that too with uh uh, capcom coming out with monster hunter worlds uh one of the uh what i think is the first true console version of it since the wii u just basically had ports um you know obviously they have all the the stuff that that you would expect all the monster hunter stuff to have in it but then they've also added so much more too there was one scene which you saw in the uh, actual uh press conference you know trailer where uh giant ravelos comes down as the guy's like you know just finished killing this t-rex and actually picks up your kill and flies away with it. Uh, there was what a dick. Uh, yeah. There was another scene where the character was actually like holding on to the T Rex's head and just like smacking him with the sword, which is obviously right. that's not something you can do in the game. And uh, one that I caught out of the corner of my eye was the T Rex eating another one of the kills, supposedly. Like you see the tail just like like spaghetti right down the thing's mouth. And like those are things that they you know have never that I've seen been in the uh, you know the PSP or the Vita or the uh, Nintendo DS versions but are going to add a whole new layer of complexity to uh, to Monster Hunter World. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of uh, of other games that uh, we got to see, uh, I got a nice hands-on with Lawbreakers while I was out yeah, there. Yeah, tell uh, us about that. That's that's the new game from uh, Cliff Blazinski. Mm-hmm. Um, this is uh, a, a, one of the fastest PvP shooters that I've ever played. Um, granted, I don't have uh, any. Uh, experience with Overwatch, um, but I, you know, I've played enough class-based shooters mm-hmm. uh, before. Um, you know, not that uh, this this was this was uh, law, Lawbreakers. I, I, cartoony is not the word for Lawbreakers, but oh, no, o- yeah. over the top uh, in the same way that that Overwatch is, mm-hmm. um, as I think a good comparison. Uh, they've got this cool gravity mechanic where you're, you know, instead of edging, uh, uh, you know, around uh, a corner, you're really taking fire from all angles. It's very, very fast, very kinetic, um, and I had a really good time. Uh, played it How'd bo- you do, though, I, I, I did okay on the PC. I did terribly on the PS4. I can't believe that there's been 
putting that on console. <laughs> like, like I'm sorry, but the difference from one to the other, like, like I feel like the the skill gap in a game like this is already in in you know uh, the the developers have already said that it's going to be a very very high skill gap. Like it's going to yes. be a very difficult game compared to something like Overwatch, which is obviously designed in a way that you can both you know professionals and casuals can get something out of it. Uh, in a game like that, when you have to look in literally every single direction. Putting it on console, I feel like it would be like an entirely different game. The way that you approach it, right? And 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 you know, being that it's a class-based you know character shooter, um, you know, there's there's nuances to every class. Like some classes didn't have a secondary fire. They you know they had some kind of ability that mm-hmm. was mapped to that button. So it was like it was a little bit disjointed trying to figure out okay where you know what do I want to try to try to play with right, here. Right. And so I you know I tried to get a feel for a little bit of everything. And there is a Wide variety of play styles that come uh, that come along with uh, with a game like Lawbreakers, which is I think really appealing. Um, but uh, but also in you know the ten minutes that we got to have hands on with it, you know not not exactly a, a, a way to uh, really shore up any kind of skill. Oh right, you know what I mean. So mm-hmm. uh, I didn't expect myself to be very good at it, but I had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so but that was you know that was one of the things was that. Uh, you you know, trying to get hands on with you know a lot of games was really difficult because the near, lines were yeah, so long. near impossible. I unfortunately didn't get get to have any hands on with any new games. Um, you know, I had a few inter- inter- interviews booked, but none of them was with actual hands on uh, experience. And one of the decisions you had to make, like at one point when uh, when we peeled off the uh, Final Fantasy fourteen line, you were going yeah. to Nino Kuni. I'm like, all right, you know, none of us have really checked out any of the Ubisoft stuff, so I'm gonna go stand in line over there. You know, I don't really have much else planned for the day. See what I can get out of there. And that's when I went over and I'm like, oh, okay, the line literally goes all the way around the Ubisoft booth. And then a new line starts that goes around the Microsoft booth. And I'm like, okay, if I stand here, maybe eventually I'll get up near the front. Uh... But then I get nothing else done. I opted instead to go around and talk to you know different vendors and and you know make contacts and network and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and and I mean you know being that we were only there for two and a half days, uh, and and you know trying to make the most absolute most of that and and introduce ourselves to as many people as possible and also have the production concerns on top of it. Actually having less. Uh, appointments for hands-on or interviews was actually kind of beneficial to us because we were able to uh, record what we needed to and not, yes. you know, not really uh, be in anyone's way, and then do very, very focused uh, networking uh, the the last day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> Chris, I wanted to ask you, uh, being the resident Nintendo fan, uh, we've already talked about uh, you know some of their their press conference. Uh, what was your takeaway from the Nintendo Treehouse? Um, well, if you want my honest opinion, kind of shitty. I mean, I wasn't expecting much because Nintendo never brings anything good at the. Give E3. us your dishonest opinion then. But um, I was expecting, I was hoping for something more, but I know I wasn't going to get it. Uh, were you were you at all surprised by the the Pokemon announcement? I think that was the only thing that that I, I, had any kind of excitement for me. I swore they were going to announce something for the Switch with Pokemon, but they didn't. And I, that was, well, that I mean, was, technically they did. I mean, they said you know we're working on a main series Pokemon game for the Switch. We're going to start planning to work on a main game Pokemon Switch game at some point in the future, maybe. I. That, I mean, it's that's as much of an announcement as you're going to get right now. You might as well have just said, uh, I mean, we, we already knew that you're going to have a Pokemon game on the Switch at some point. So they really didn't really give us any. Sort of a foregone conclusion. Yeah, yeah. I so, don't know that it was. I don't know that that a Pokemon Pokemon game on the Switch was a foregone conclusion. Well, I mean, it was a foregone conclusion for me until I heard that they were going to actually try to keep the 3DS on uh, life support and keep putting games out on it yeah apparently there's a, a statement from reggie who's saying that um they have plans for the 3ds well into 2018 dude when when robbie was t- saying that in the car on the way down here that just kind of like it, it took every fiber of my being not to just drive my car into an overpass I, it's got to be hard to be a nintendo fan at this point i mean i'm personally i'm used to it by now because i haven't actually played any like the really new games like like, I don't really play, like, most of the Zelda games. I play all the old shit, like the Nintendo retro shit, uh-huh. like Super Nintendo and stuff. But, um, uh, like, the last Star Fox game I played was 64. I play a little bit of the new ones, but I can't get into them. 
Yeah, uh, so. but yet you always buy the fucking hardware, though. Yeah, mostly for Smash, I guess. Um, I mean, come on. you And, and for the Nintendo Mario games. I buy all the new Mario games. I, I mean, given the full arc of the Wii U, you've got to feel burned by that purchase. You've got to feel burned by that purchase. Do you really feel like you got what you paid for the Wii U out of the Wii U? Yes, but not from the games. It's basically as a Netflix so ne- like Netflix so, so, okay yeah so, so if, if I didn't have if I had like a like a Roku box or uh, any, any any other any other console any other last gen console yeah yeah wow then, so that's really sad I mean Smash was good on the Wii U and uh, the Mario games that I got for it like a new Super Mario Brothers and all that stuff but I mean personally yeah uh, Nintendo was pretty pretty shitty so why I, I just i don't understand why nintendo thinks that they need to keep supporting the 3ds do don't ask me because that is the most fucking ridiculous thing i've ever heard in my life you have a brand new console that can go portable yeah that can have way more processing power than the fucking 3ds which is on life support at this point your, your pokemon games can't even handle the 3ds anymore yeah like you get frame rate drops in normal double battles yeah why do you think it's a good idea to keep keep developing for this system? Well, because uh, according to Nintendo, they think that the Switch is a home console experience that no, see, okay, that, that's the, that's the that problem. you They're can take them, with you. They're shooting themselves in the foot again. Like, they did the same thing with the, with the Wii U, and now they're doing the same thing where they're like, oh, let's just diverge portable and console. And by doing that, you're basically saying you have no faith in the home console. Yeah. So why should anyone buy into your home console? They shouldn't. I mean, on, honestly, I, that, I'm glad that I haven't invested in a Switch at this point. I would feel like I, I had wasted if, my money. If I had had this E3 and all the shit that came out from it before I had bought the Switch, I wouldn't buy the Switch. I wouldn't have bought it. I was kind of banking on the assumption that Pokemon on the Switch will be out 2018. Uh, and it's not. You'll probably get it at the end of 2018. Yeah, I'd say. I'd say because they're 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 usually looking at like November releases is usually when Pokemon's come out. Right? Especially especially with with uh, Ultra Sun and Moon slated for what was that November for, or se- yeah, September exactly. or November for, for November. Yeah, and they said that this next Pokemon for the Switch is. Over a year out, which November is more, you know, is a couple months away, another year. Yeah, I think you'll see November 28th. I mean, it, that that'll mark that'll mark what a less than a year between the release of Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Moon. Like that, that has to be less than a year. It's pretty close. It might be right at the year mark. Actually, yeah, it's it's basically a year. So. Which I think is usually how it uh, ends up turning out when they, come out, when they when they come out with like a brand new like generation. Usually a year later, you will either get like you know a black two, white two, or the Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, or you'll get uh, a re-release, kind of like how we did with like Sapphire and uh, and Ruby. Stank Buddha asking in the chat, did they say anything about the virtual console? <laughs> no, nope. actually, well, no, okay, well, actually okay, they well, did. Well, they did say something about the virtual console. They not, said not, not what you want to hear. They said we didn't say anything about a virtual console in an interview with Reggie, he was asked about the virtual console, specifically GameCube, and he said, we never used the term virtual console. Yes, they did. And then there's an editor note that said, yes, they did. Yes, they did. They totally did. Yeah. So, nope. Nope, not at all. Isn't no that- virtual console. And if it's any, like, you're... Oh, my God. This is why it's so hard to even remotely say anything nice about Nintendo because you know what's going to happen is when they eventually release the not virtual console is all the shit you bought on the Wii and the Wii U, you're going to have to buy it again because oh, it's yeah. not, not even a fucking unified uh, service. Why, why Why would you think And then otherwise? you're going to have to pay $5, $10 for Super Mario World why would again. You, why would you think otherwise? Like, why, why would it be? Because literally every single other game developer does that. I know. Well, that's because every other single game developer doesn't have an indoctrinated audience that will do every single thing they want to and eat shit when they shovel it into your mouth. He's kind of right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, God, that was depressing. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, Did you want something different from me? How's your How's your bubble? Like, are you ever going to get out of the bubble? I've told you before, my bubble consists of the Super Nintendo bubble. That's my bubble. It's just kind of, my bubble touches the new age games a little bit. But but you you even just said that when they come out with a virtual console for the Switch, you're going to buy all that Super Nintendo stuff again, aren't you? No, they are. 
I'm going to fucking say, fuck you, Nintendo. I'm going to play on an emulator on the computer. <laughs> yeah, but again, but again, you... Because you can't extort me again for the same shit I've already bought on the Wii U and the Wii. But... but and 3DS. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> but again, but again, Chris, like you, you laid out the money for the switch. Like you, you bought it. Like if I, if, I was, if you were if you were, if you were if you were as cynical as you were claiming, you would have held off on that on that purchase like I did. No, no, because bought I, it on faith, man. Yeah, on faith. Well, okay, on the assumption that Smash Bros. will come out. I'm going to buy the Mario game, because I like Mario games, and on the assumption that Pokemon will eventually come out. Oh, you'll probably get Mario vs. Rabbids, right? Or Mario x Rabbids. <laughs> yeah, okay. Can, I, I, can, can you rent games still? Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Gamefly. Gamefly's a thing. I don't know if you can rent Switch games from it. Anyway, let's talk about Ubisoft, uh, because uh, they, they definitely, I think, had... The best conference. They had some of the the, the, the most, best reveals. Yeah. Yes. Oh man, did they ever! Um, starting with uh, Mario and Rabbids. Um, so, I, I I expected to hate this. I expected. Yes. I expected <laughs> you to hate this. Thank uh, you. Just when I saw the title, but then when I saw it being played, I went, "Oh no! Oh, Chris is gonna. Chris may actually like this." I'm like, "Hmm. Wait." Strategy RPG? Yeah. Like it's, it looks like XCOM. It's He's hiding very, behind a box. Very the much box XCOM. exploded. This is literally XCOM. Yeah. What? So, uh, how. Nintendo's new strategy let other people make AAA games, copy them with Mario. <laughs> so, what? I mean, I don't know how to feel about this game because A, it looks good. It like everything like is in the right orders like loadouts and like people and, and it stuff. takes place in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mushroom so it's, Kingdom. It's visually appealing. On the other, you're hand, not stuck with Rayman's stupid nonsense. On the other hand, there's rabbits in the game. Well, just just think of them like minions. That's essentially what they are. They are. They, are. they, they predated minions, but for starters, they are what minions are to everybody else just in the Nintendo world. He's yeah. right. And that, that makes them bad. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's so a bad thing. We're, we're aware. We're, okay. we're aware. I'm just Thank trying you. to ruin this for as many people as I can. Um, I, So, you going to get it? <sighs> I don't want to. You're going to get I, it. I want to play gonna, it. You're going to get I it. I want to play it. I'm, you're going to get I'm it. I'm probably going to get it. Uh, Far Cry 5, also uh, part of Ubisoft's saw, presentation. Saw a little bit of that, man. I did. Far Cry's looking better and better and better. Dude, I'm definitely buying this game. The, there, so there's, definitely the, buying they, this They showed game. us a bunch of different characters. Uh, there was a sharpshooter. There was a guy in a, a, a helicopter. There was a dog that, after killing a guy, brought his weapon back to you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? that? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I've never been that invested in the Far Cry series. Mm -hmm. Uh, did I never played one before? Um, I, I've played, I, I think I've played some of one of them, but I, I can't remember. I watched which uh, one. a roommate play quite a bit of four. And I mean, you know, it looks like stuff that's all been done before, right? So, um, and it's funny because, you know, we took, uh, we took some flack on, uh, on Twitter, uh, the the week that we had decided to talk about the reaction to Far Cry Five, <laughs> flack is that what we're going to call it? Uh, from from someone who uh, insisted that we didn't know what we were talking about because uh, the 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 guy in it couldn't be a Christian because he was a cult leader. Those uh, come mutually, on, don't be shitty. Mutually exclusive things, right? Um, because those were a bunch of cult crucifixes that I saw. All over the ground and all over the flag and all all over the fucking game. Like uh, they belong to Jesus, right? Yeah, uh, I, I, it's. Uh, I I am very excited to check out this game. Uh, thematically, it looks mm -hmm. great. Uh, right up there with with Wolfenstein: The New Colossus. Yeah. We'll we'll get to that in just a second. But um, real quick, uh, the the biggest Ubisoft announcement, the biggest surprise. The biggest pop, the biggest reaction, the biggest everything. Beyond Good and Evil Two, this is I can't believe that this is actually now getting a sequel. Now, now Nate, you and I have mostly seen like nothing but positive reactions to it, but Chris was telling me on the way here that he's noticed a lot of people who were big fans of the original Beyond Good and Evil are lamenting this game because it looks nothing like the original. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of people have been saying how it like doesn't fit the theme or the feel of the original, which I, I'm I'm sorry, I don't have context for the original one. It was it was far more cartoony. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was it was definitely cartoony, and this was based in uh, you know the character designs were based far more realistically, uh, photo realistically. Yeah, yeah. there you go, photo realistically. <laughs> um, but you know I. <sighs> I I think that that's a dumb reason to be upset about a, a game. Um, it came, you know, the first the first Beyond Good and Evil came out two thousand three. Wow, Jesus, the year that I graduated <laughs> high school. <laughs> and uh, you know, you've got to consider what what was what were its contemporaries for the time. Um, and I, I God, I'm trying to I'm even trying to think. Like I want to say I want to say the first Fable game mm-hmm. came out maybe around the same time. Yeah, um, somewhere in there. Yeah, maybe a year or two after that. But I mean, like we're talking like that kind of that kind of graphic power. Um, I, I was very the impressed. Final Fantasy X two. Really? That, that was a con- contemporary to that game, right? That came 2003? out in two thousand three. Yeah. Um, um, but anyway, I I was definitely jarred by the photorealistic um graphics and and i didn't because i didn't know what the fuck i was looking at yeah. <laughs> at first and i actually didn't kind of like it at first i thought it was stupid uh, the way and kind of goofy that, that the monkey and the pig guy were interacting like, like yeah i immediately was thinking nate's gonna hate this um but but the fact that it's beyond good and evil 2 uh makes me go fuck it i i'm in I'm yeah, fucking. It's in. so over the top. Yeah, it is so ridiculous. Um. All right. So let's uh, let's backtrack a little bit. Talk about Bethesda, uh, Wolfenstein Two: The New Colossus. Uh, I've been describing this to people as Goldeneye meets a Tarantino film on PCP. Yeah, that's that's pretty fair. Uh, good old shooting Nazis. <laughs> good old shooting Nazis. That is uh, that is one of my favorite pastimes uh, ever. Um and uh, the I, I I this makes me think that I should check out the other modern Wolfenstein games because I I think Two, I gave them a pass. Was, one came out in 2014, another yeah. one in 2015, and I think they said that this one is lightly based or or or, or follows the 2014 one. I think. Uh, of course, of course, this has got all of the uh, the. Uh, Does Wolfenstein really need lore or story behind it? Not uh, if you're killing Nazis. You just, just uh, kill the kill, Nazis. Kill Nazis. Yeah. Don't punch them, though. That's not politically correct <laughs> or something. Um, well, I, I mean, you know, talking about reactions to a game, uh, those, you know, those same snowflakes that got really butthurt about the depictions in Far Cry 5 Look, guys, uh, are also really upset about the fact that Nazis are n- white. N- n- uh, you, you have to realize, these people know what they're talking about. They were big fans of the other Wolfenstein games, and they have no problem with killing Nazis. Nazis, but these Nazis are white. Wait, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. That's that's just pretty sure Nazis only come in one flavor, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nazis, kind of, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think the the reaction to this has been hilarious. Yeah. Uh, if if not if not over the top, um, and you know what? Uh, it, it's funny because you know. Uh, six years ago, four years ago, whenever the uh, the other Wolfenstein game had come out, um, you didn't have that kind of reaction. And uh, I guess it's it, it's because people weren't identifying as their shitty selves that they are in 2017. Like they're like, oh, I resemble that. Yeah, looking in the mirror hurts, don't it? Um, and, and I mean, you know, the- grab them by the pussy. <laughs> can just kind of throw that in with all of your uh you know ooh white racism memes like uh, poor <laughs> poor me i'm being discriminated against like no you fucking not no you're not just stop it uh, that's i'm so i'm so tired of this this idea that like there are some white people out there who think that the way that we end racism is that we end it against white people and so they want to they want to point out every fucking slight and every you know but like the reality of it is is that like racism mostly against white people gets spread in pithy memes across the internet all most other forms of racism will have you dead by cop Okay, so it, let's let's weigh the two here. What's what's more important that we spend our time on people's feelings being hurt on the internet because they feel like they're not being included in a in in a conversation about race or racism or blood in the streets because that's the options. People's feelings being hurt. 
the first one clearly clearly that's what we need to spend time on fucking ugh. anyway um uh also the evil within two that was what a fucking weird this is the trailer second, i can't wait for the second e3 in a row where they've sold me on a horror game and i absolutely hate the genre yeah I'm in. I'm totally in. Unfortunately, me too. This looked like an acid trip mixed with a peyote experience. Like, I, 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 now I gotta go, like, not only do I have to play older Far Cry games, not only now do I have to play the first Wolfenstein game, I've got to play the first Evil Within. Like, god damn it. This I've got so many things to play before these things actually come out, and they're all they're all releasing fairly soon. Too. All almost everything is in October, so I hope you're rich. Yeah, uh, EA. Uh, also, uh, we saw Assassin's Creed Origin. Um, I I noticed a lot of overlap between Metal Gear Solid. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of the so. more recent successful open world like action sort of games uh, have been doing a lot of things right. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn's another one that uh, Assassin's Creed seems to be taking uh, a few play style sort of tips from for, for the first time in a very very long time i actually want to play an assassin's creed game yeah yeah uh and i think the fact that they um set this before uh any of the other previous games the fact that they're not attaching the narrative to the desmond stuff yep i did think, ever get resolved no i don't i don't think it did <laughs> and at um, least now people like me and nate don't feel like we have to go back and play all the yes, shitty ones yes. in order to get into this one exactly yeah i feel like i've got a jumping off point yep. and and i'm in i'm sold i'm i'm definitely going to be playing assassin's creed origins i i liked dude i legit liked the first assassin's creed game which very few people that like will admit to still liking mm-hmm. um and i like the the Ezio stuff yeah so, the Ezio stuff was great Ezio stuff was fucking awesome what man. jumps out me the most about this is how they've changed up the progression based system you actually level up in this now there's like a talent tree and everything okay yeah um yeah i i think i feel like they've taken uh a, a much more like in um it's weird to say because because ubisoft always kind of takes an inclusive approach but they've they've taken a, a much more incorporated approach taking elements from other games that have done well mm-hmm. and uh and and bringing them into assassin's creed and expanding on stuff like the stealth element you know you've got that hawk where you can now mark enemies and again i know that that's that that's a, a, a mechanic that is you Used in a lot of other games and a lot of you know specific like third person games, but it's a game that or the, it's a mechanic that I knew first from Metal Gear Solid Five. So it definitely feels like it's got a heavy aspect of of that playing uh, playing a role, and I like that. I, I I really enjoyed my time with Metal Gear Solid Five. So seeing that um, you know kind of translated to uh, you know to, to Assassin's Creed is definitely kind of uh, welcoming. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also also got the uh, the announcement of Anthem, oh. Robbie. Um, <laughs> this, this game looks good. Oh. I think I think that this uh, that this announcement was bittersweet for you. Yeah, uh, because while Anthem <laughs> while Anthem looks really impressive and and looks awesome and is most likely the culmination of the Dylan project, um, that uh, Mass Effect Andromeda had a lot of promises problem. philosophy principles behind it that facial didn't, things that didn't pay off that, but it, but that we see now in anthem and the creative director of anthem is actually the creative director of mass effect andromeda too so <laughs> it's hard not to get all kind of like conspiracy theory tinfoil hey, patty it, on it get but. get all conspiracy theory on it because here's the thing is that you know there you know now there has been um, you know, pretty considerable evidence to show that there was tension and 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 miscommunications between the uh, 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 Montreal and the Edmonton studios that were um, you know kind of responsible for the the two projects, and that in some ways, you know, I I think that there's this feeling out there that um, it, you know that that Andromeda may have been. I mean, sabotaged is a really is a really bad word, but internal <laughs> in, eat it, dick. But sabotage in, it, seems too mu- like there's too much intent uh, on it. I don't know, man. I don't know when you when you start to pick apart the details of the relationship between no, those two I, studios, no, d- dude. I, I'm I understand. I'm I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I just think that it might have been more opportunistic than that. I don't think this one was like we must sabotage the Andromeda, blah 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 blah. But I think somewhere along the no, line, but someone think, probably thought saw a different path to take 
uh, and, and and Andromeda unfortunately uh, uh, t- bared a big brunt. For, you know, a big blow from that. I mean, you said that the, there were core concepts that should have been in Andromeda that were not. Yes, core. that look like they're a part of uh, of Anthem. Uh, of yes. Anthem. Yes. And and but like, okay, if what is it other than sabotage? If you go, okay, this is a really cool gameplay element, but we're not going to give it to. Andromeda, well, like we're going to give it to Sabotage, the, the, the word specifically, sabotage, has this intent behind it. Like, hey, that project, I want it to fail. I am going to cause it irrevocable harm so it fails. I, dude, again, when you look at the relationship between Edmonton and Montreal, the, between those two studios... I mean, you, I, you get the bug eyes. <laughs> the bug eyes. Yeah. I, I, no, it goes, it goes, it goes beyond the bug eyes thing, Chris. It, it does. It goes, it goes far beyond that. Dylan was originally the the code name given to Andromeda because they wanted to create a timeless game that people would reference for years to come, like you do with Bob Dylan songs. Right. Okay. But now recently, people have been referring to Anthem, saying that Anthem was Project Dylan, and the way that Andromeda was shuttered off to Montreal Studios, which was you know a, a smaller subsidiary of Bioware, makes me think that they had so much stuff here. All these gameplay elements, all these different things that they wanted to put into this game that at some point someone was like, you know, we can't fit all this stuff in here. And this sort of stuff right here would make a pretty good game all on its own. And it was sort of like, all right, well, you know what? The Montreal Studio can finish up on the Andromeda stuff and let's start working on this other awesome game. I don't know, man. I think I actually I think I you know, and it's weird that I'm the one that's getting more tinfoil hat about this. I actually think that there, that it goes a lot deeper than yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as far as quote unquote evidence goes, there was an article on Kotaku about, you know, the the sordid storied history of what happened to Andromeda. It was all it's all first-hand accounts, all of it's anonymous though, you know, no one wanted to actually go on the record about it. Sure. But again, you know, when you look at the the relationship between these two games and the studio and when you read a bunch of these different comments, it definitely seems like there's something dirty going on there. Now, had this been a completely different studio had Bethesda came out with Anthem just a big coincidence right but the fact that this happened within the same studio that had the same creative director on both of those projects yeah, it, it seemed, there's got to be something more there it, it seemed like they were diverting resources from one project to another in favor of of one versus the other yeah. especially when you consider like how quickly Andromeda felt like it came out yeah like there was a huge rush of information then it was out well you know Andromeda's been quote unquote in development since the end of three but in that same article it mentions that most of the core developing of the game itself happened within the last 18 months right and 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 the thing is is that we didn't see much about it in the in the run-up to its release i feel like you know they really botched that release they that's one that they could have easily pushed the release date back for and not rushed out to market yeah and and you know what i think that they really needed to, especially with the shellacking that the Mass Effect brand took with the ending, of, the original ending of three. Yeah. Um, after that, you you had to really earn that goodwill back, and and I think that you know, uh, if, it, it, despite how good Anthem may or may not be, that you know, diverting resources or or letting you know internal squabbles um you know pick that pick that project apart is i i think that that's really sad that's really unfortunate and i feel really bad for you know all of the developers that you know put really hard think, work and time into that and that's... and had that you know and and either through circumstance or through um you, you know internal politics had had that opportunity taken away from them because Montreal was a secondary studio. Yes. This was their opportunity to sort of bring themselves up into that AAA development light internally mm-hmm. and go, look, we can we can take on big projects. We don't have to just do, you know, coding work or texturing work or whatever they were doing in, in terms of a, a secondary support staff to main development projects. And and that that is really disappointing. And 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 again, I, I don't mean to get all tinfoil hat on it, but it does seem like internally there was there was some problems in trying to make that transition happen and that there were some people who didn't want to see it happen yeah i think the real heartbreak there you hit he hit the nail on the head there was when it comes to the developers because when it comes to me like yeah does it suck that that this looks like what mass effect should have been sure but you know what i still get to play it 
right? I'm still going to enjoy it. And, and, and as fans, whether you're a fan of Mass Effect or not, you know, maybe you think, oh, you know what? The trilogy or the IP or the name of the franchise is shit now, whatever. You move on to a different game. There were people that have put years and years and years of their life, their blood, sweat, and tears into that project. And it's more to them than just, you know, a franchise title. And to see it go down when it maybe possibly could have been what Anthem is now, it does really suck. Yeah, so. it does. Uh, all right. So let's talk about the PlayStation Conference. One that was, uh, I think, in, and we even said this during our coverage, uh, a bit underwhelming. Let down. And, yeah. and, and you know, to be fair to Sony, I think it was only a letdown because there was so much expectation around it. You know, and so- because everyone else, uh, everyone else had upped their production game so much, which is what Sony usually is, you know, uh, uh, lauded for. Uh, it made them, in comparison, seem like a lot more of a of a letdown. Uh, I, yeah, I, and 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 again, mostly what we heard from them uh, was stuff that we already knew. Yes, the um, only actual new things that we got was uh, the Shadow of the Colossus remake, and, which is a remake, which is a remake, uh, and then uh, Monster Hunter Worlds. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Other than that, we had seen everything else and even the stuff that we had already seen we didn't really get it it's like we got new gameplay or anything like that except right. with the exception of spider-man yeah um and the spider-man stuff that they showed off was really impressive again uh we drew the parallels to arkham and what arkham did for batman i think that this spider-man uh stands to do something similar for yes. the spider-man franchise and uh i i was very impressed with what i saw i i really liked it um I, you know it's been since maximum carnage since i've really felt like i I've I've enjoyed a Spider-Man game. I did not get into any mm-hmm. of the 3D ones on the PlayStation or PlayStation 2. Right, right. Um, and and this was something that I thought was very very exciting. And the the thing that we didn't get to talk about on uh, on on Checkpoint was at the very very end of the conference, getting you know getting this reveal of Miles Morales and, and how he's somehow going he's somehow to somehow connected in, to, in the story. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has a lot of really exciting potential because that a first of all that was purposeful. Like mm-hmm. they did that oh, yeah. absolutely on purpose. Yeah, it wasn't just at the end of the the Spider-Man reveal. It was at the end of the conference they cut back to it. Right. And and I saw a couple of people, you know, uh, immediately who responded to that was like, "Oh, were we watching Miles the entire time is this a Miles game? You actually hear people Peter referred to himself as Peter, like, come on, Pete, you got this, you got this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that sort of p- uh, pokes a bit of a hole in the thought that it, it is a strictly that, a Miles game. That we couldn't play as Miles at some point, though, if he gets the powers. I, I Yeah, exactly. And I think that that, um, it, you know, that that lends itself well to uh, sequels, spinoffs, yep. you know, and we've uh, already a got lot the, of potential. We've here. already got confirmation, too, from uh, Insomniac or Sony that, uh, that that different costumes would be playing a big role in, in the game. So you will be able to switch up the costume. I I, I really just glamour from loot boxes. Probably. I, I, I mean, I know it's going to take a game or two, but I can't wait to see Venom or Carnage. Um, though that that's I think what I'm mm-hmm. what I'm excited yeah. for. Um, so uh, let's see. We also got, uh, of course, the Shadow of Colossus remake. It looks great, but it's it it's a remake. Yeah. Um, Days Gone. It was that zombie game that was very overwhelming. We saw uh, two years uh, or a year ago out at E3, just these huge, massive waves and on hordes of zombies. Um, those hordes were not as present this had go round. They shown hmm. this trailer last year. I would have had a very different impression. Yeah, of this yeah, game. it wouldn't have left left the same impact that it did. Right, because mm-hmm. I think in this trailer they were, you know, they were definitely showing off the sneak uh, and 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 stealth aspects of gameplay, yep. which had the effect of making it feel much more like um, uh, The Last of Us yes. than, uh, you know, something that that is going to be bringing a, a, a more unique experience. Um, I, again, I, you know, those zombie waves are really Was something that's... Terrifying. It, it is, and it, and it still sticks out, um, you know, in, in my mind today. Uh, what if that zombie wave is just like one set piece and that only happens once? I don't think it is. Yeah, I, that I, would be a big letdown. It, it would be, it would uh, be a huge letdown. Yeah. Biggest takeaway that I had from this trailer, of course, they showed zombie wolves and zombie bears. And what's cool, and, and, and no other, I think, franchise has really done this besides, obviously, the T virus in uh, Resident Evil, which is much more, you know, I think on a fantastic scale, uh, is the fact that more than just humans can be affected by this virus. Yeah, yeah. Um, the zombie bear was uh, was was kind of cool, but I thought a little bit, I don't know, weird note to Hokey? end your. Tra- yeah, a little. Like, like that was a their little. big thing. Like, guys. 
Bears. Zomb- yeah. Zombears. Um, and then uh, we also got uh, to, to take another look at uh, Detroit. Which gave uh, didn't show too much more, but at least at least uh, opened up, uh, expanded on what the, I the premise is going to be. I cannot take this game fucking seriously at all. I cannot take this game seriously at all. Just because I know who, who made it. It's the same guy who made Indigo Prophecy. Which, spoiler alert, if you're not familiar with Indigo Prophecy, that game ends with a Dragon Ball Z-style fight against a sentient version of the internet. So, it's basically a terrible version of Serial Experiments Lane. And it's not good. It's not subtle. It's not clever. Um, and 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 it's most like it's an entire game that's done mostly with 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 quick time events, and it's just yeah, you're right. We haven't actually seen it's just any fucking like horrible. real straight up gameplay, and and I don't think you will because you know in the same way that Heavy Rain was a series of of <gasps> of, game. of of quick time events because it's the it's the the same guy, same guy who made Heavy Rain too. Oh my god, this game is gonna suck. It's gonna be fucking terrible. It's gonna be <sighs> horrible because it's just gonna be a series of quick time events, and then you get to choose. Where you go. It's a choose your own adventure story, basically. Mm. Uh, and it's set in Detroit uh, with with androids. Androids seem to be playing a big the role. The Android Revolution. Yeah. I, Skynet. This is just going to be. I mean, I, I'm sure that some people are going to laud it for its narrative and bill- whatever. The, this guy. Video games are art. This the the guy who makes this thing is a just is a hack and I'm I'm not excited for this nah. at all. I'm sorry. I I have to be honest about it. I didn't get a chance to to but get what, what to, about, to see it. I I wanted to. I wanted to get a presentation on it just so I could have a better idea of how hacky it's going to be. Mm-hmm. But just based on his other work, I don't see this being good in any way, shape, or form. But it's based in Detroit, and you live in Detroit. Yeah, so that's, I know. That's going to be a no a, appeal for you. Not at all. Why not? Uh, you have to play it, though. I, <laughs> I mean, I'll play it. I'll play it and mock it the entire time. But ugh, I, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that game being good in the least. Well, luckily, you have a bunch of other games to look forward to. Yeah. Are uh, you hold on, Are you looking forward to this game? Eh. Robbie? No? Mm. No. Okay. Why would you? Why would you? Not, not when you have other games like Anthem or Wolfenstein. And games with out. gameplay in it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the Spider-Man game, Actual, Beyond Good and Evil Two, Far Cry Five. Like, oh, there's so many good y- things. You know, video games. Um. Anyway, so uh, I, I that that sort of summarizes most of our uh, you know most of our our big uh, reactions, opinions, yeah, we, uh, views uh, on E3. Did um, we skip Microsoft? No, I mean. Mm, no, I don't think we did. We talked about oh no, we man, didn't talk about the Xbox One or backwards. Compatibility. Xbox One X, yeah. I, I, I mean, honestly, the, the, the best thing about the Xbox One X is the acronym. Shut up. Honestly, the, the X- acronym is Xbox. There's guys. nothing new to say about it because any strengths that somebody might you know be able to come on and be like, oh, well, what about this now? It's still undercut by the fact that you can just get all the games on Windows 10. I mean, not just that, but I, I, I mean. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, it it will. It's the world's most powerful console, and it, and it's got it's at a decent price point. Um, I I think the big the big thing about Microsoft's press conference was uh, the backwards compatibility yeah, stuff that they're coming out with the original Xbox collection, right? And the thing is, is I just I'm I don't know if there's that much in that lineup that really say, excites me. The only game I can remember that I really enjoy playing from the Xbox is Fusion Frenzy, which is a party game. <laughs> I don't of course. don't recall that one. Yeah. Um, and that's the that's the thing is that when I stopped to think about it, there was just not a whole lot in the li- in the backwards compatibility library that mm-hmm. activated me. It's a good feature to have. I think it's smart. Um, it would have been I, it would have been so much better if it were Sony that did this exact program because there's so much in the Sony library oh that I want to. Oh my god! Oh my god! Right? Right? Like, right? <laughs> I, I was I was hoping that this was pushing Sony into a position where they felt they needed to respond. Absolutely but not. Then no, again, they're done. Remember, we got that. We did that, or, or there was that uh, interview or quote that came out uh, a while ago where that Sony exec was like, eh, "Backwards compatibility. Exactly. They look yeah. Bad. They'd yeah. rather remaster games and sell them to you for sixty dollars than put them for ten dollars on a virtual console, which is obvious by. Uh, Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, Crash that's ex- Bandicoot. That's exactly what they're doing. Parappa the Rapper. There you go. Uh, all right. So uh, just uh, uh, general thoughts, Robbie, um, having gone to E3 it now was, for the first time. It was exciting. It was overwhelming. It was hectic. It was tiring. It was amazing. It was like 
everything just balled up into one and I'm glad that I'm finally home and it's over with and I'm really looking forward to next year when hopefully we can plan things out better and, and I think the only thing that would have made it better is had I got some Maybe. hands-on experience oh. with some of the actual you know really big games I agree but I think that that would have also necessitated more time like yes. uh, a bigger uh, yep. track the time out yep. there uh, uh, Chris how about you uh, thoughts about going to E3 for the first time oh, oh wait oh wait. wait we couldn't buy two seats on the plane to accommodate <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We meant. I love uh, you, Chris. That was I good. Do. That was good. Mm. Uh, no. Ed, any any final thoughts for E3? Yeah, E3 never does it for me because Nintendo doesn't go anymore. <laughs> And you know what? Looking at the small re- or, or looking at the big reaction they got from the small they did, if they actually put effort into a real conference and like really producing something for these, they would wipe the floor with that's even the o- Sony that's, every year. That's the overall problem with Nintendo is that they just phone it in on everything. everything. Every, absolutely everything. They're just pacing themselves. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. They've been pacing themselves forever. I know. Um, and, uh, you know, just I, I, in terms of uh, my final thoughts, again, I just want to thank everyone uh, who, you know, made this uh, possible through your support over at patreon.com slash limit break radio. Um, you know, one of the things we 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 didn't have to pay for, uh, you know, all of our travel and mm-hmm. lodging. Um, a lot of that was afforded by uh, the opportunity that we have with Chuck point radio um but you know it, it, it again it is your support that brought us to this point and uh we're we're really proud of the work that we were able to do out from e3 2017 and we we're looking forward to it next year i think that all of us you know on the heels of e3 have have seen you know what kind of uh uh tangible good that it's done and uh, i think that we're just going to kind of continue to uh to double down on that yeah. we, we want that to continue and uh, I think that we're we're going to make the commitment to going to E3 every year. And and again, uh, you know, this all started with you guys. Like you know, two years ago, when uh, when we were just bringing Limit Break Radio uh, kind of back from the dead and and bringing the Patreon account up and 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 allowing you guys to uh, to to support the show and to to support the business. That you know, if, if you had told us you know two years later you're going to be At E3. covering covering E3 live from e3 i would have told you to go fuck yourself that you're fucking crazy and that e3 is useless and <laughs> may, 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 maybe i would have if I, maybe, yeah. um uh, at that time maybe yeah uh, but uh, no i i definitely um it, it was it was really humbling to sort of be in the heart of the 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 industry that we're yes. re- we're reporting on that's and a, that's a good analogy there and i i think that you know one of the things that was really important for us as a crew you know we've been we've been grinding at this um you know we've been doing checkpoint radio for for 20 episodes uh we've now been doing final encounter cast for 68. 68 episodes uh limit break radio is almost into its 120th episode um and and the thing that is nice to remind ourselves and and to you know connect with the audience is um you know to to just go out and and interface with people and just remind us to to remind us exactly why we do this and um you know yes we want to we want to eventually end up making money off of this and yes we actually we eventually want this to be our full-time job but you know at the core of it the reason that we started doing any of this was a pure passion and love for wanting to talk about video games and wanting to bring that to the radio and wanting to bring that kind of discussion to uh you know our our own audience yeah Yeah. exactly the people that that want to talk like you know about stuff like this and and like stuff like this so Mm -hmm. um you know that that's always been at the at the center of what we do and you know to just kind of on a very basic level go out and and kind of connect with that and and get some you know very crucial and and positive feedback i think did wonders for us as a crew and and instilling um you know that 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 work ethic and a and stronger sense of purpose yes exactly uh, yeah i'd like to also uh i mean we thank her all the time but especially for e3 we need to give a big big 
big, big shout out to Kuki, who of course does everything for us, but has she not been there this year and of course had the experience from, from previous E3's past, yeah. this would have been such a shit show for us. Absolutely, yeah. It, it really was uh, because of uh, Kuki's hard work and, and diligence and, um, you know, uh, she kept up on, on all of the dumb questions that we would ask where things were, where we were supposed to be uh, in, in the, the Facebook chat, and uh, she, she did an excellent job uh, coordinating all of us and uh, yes, thank you so much to to, to Kuki. And that, of course, um, goes back to our listener base as well, because had it not been for them, we never would have hired her. That's true. Hashtag hire Kuki. Yep. Uh, all right, guys, that's going to do it here for Final EncounterCast. Uh, that's our E3 2017 summary debriefing. Uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. FinalEncounterCast.com to go subscribe to the show. Leave us a little bit of iTunes love. We broke the iTunes Top 100 for video game podcasts. We'd love to get that even further. That happens with your ratings and uh, reviews over at Apple Podcasts and iTunes. So please go do that if you have a spare moment. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in today. Uh, let's see, all 150 of you joining us for the show this afternoon. If you want to join us live Sundays at 1 p.m. at twitch.tv slash Limit Break Radio. Thank you very much to my crew. We've got Skrull, who does our YouTube videos. Kooky Persona, our producer, the one, the only, the epic, and uh, the uh, missed. I, we, we definitely uh, miss Kooky now that we're back home. It, 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 was, it, was, it was awesome being able to hang out with her. Kooky's the best Kooky. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, of course, to my crew, even though they're not here, Callie and Nika, uh, Robbie, Chris, I'm Nate. Have a good one. Final EncounterCast is a production of FinalEncounterCast.com, Limit Break Radio, and Bender Media Productions. Today's episode was produced by Kooky Persona and Callie Sloan. This show is made possible by the generous Patreon donors of the podcast, Limit Break Radio. Opening music provided by Keyboard Kid. More info and music can be found at KeyboardKid206.Bandcamp.com. Closing music provided by Sobzy. For more info, visit Sobzy.Bandcamp.com. Final EncounterCast and its hosts are solely responsible for its content. 